Verse 17 and 18. Lesson 9 I have titled Hymenaeus and Philetus, uh, which are two people named in verse 17. We finished last week with the instruction to shun profane and vain babblings. And we talked about what shunning was, what profane and vain babblings were. And these were not, as uh, some Bible versions want to point out, simply irreverent talk, cursing, speaking dirty language. This has to do with bad doctrine, right? wrong teaching which Paul calls profane and vain babblings, for they will increase in a more ungodliness. So again, it's just not dirty talk, filthy talk, not Sunday talk. This is, this is doctrine that will affect your behavior and your understanding of God, which is what godliness is. So that's verse 16. Verse 17 then, the thought continues, their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Wow, what a calling of names. We'll do with that in a bit here. Their word, we have to just clarify again, the word that eats as doth a canker, which includes Hymenaeus and Philetus' words, their teaching, is the profane and vain babblings of verse 16. Right? So the profane and vain. These are words to no profit, not profitable to the hearer, to the Christian, to the believer, to anybody. Um, it says their word will eat as doth a canker. And this is where it's like, what in the world? What kind of archaic King James language? Canker. And uh, the, the phrase itself, as you'll find in your King James Bible, actually helps you define words that you may not use every day, even though canker is a word still in our vocabulary. So in that way, it's not archaic. And it's something that was used before, and it's a part of the English language. Uh, you can understand what it is. It's not the very least understanding from the, the phrase. Their word will eat as doth a canker. What does a canker do? It eats, apparently. That's what it means. Um, the definition is given for you there. It, the definition of the dictionary, if you look it up, is a corruption that destroys by eating away bit by bit. And uh, so in other versions of the Bible, they'll, they'll change the word canker to cancer, or more popularly, gangrene, which just rolls off the tongue, gangrene. Uh, gangrene is actually a quite close transliteration from the Greek. The Greek word here uh, sounds like gangrene, is what I'm talking about, and that's why they put it there. They say, well, obviously these King James translators were ignorant uh, the, the very Greek word is where we get our English word gangrene, that disease that eats away and mortifies your flesh. Uh, what's interesting about that is that the translators knew about the word gangrene. They put it in the marginal note. They said, or gangrene, and they chose canker instead. What does that tell you? That they weren't ignorant. They knew what they were doing. That's what that tells you. They thought a second time about it. And then just quickly say, hey, you know what, that sounds like our English word gangrene. And then they thought twice. They're like, yeah, I think canker's going to be a better word here. And why would that be? Not only because, as the New King James likes to put cancer in there. Cancer is a very medical term for us today, right? It doesn't necessarily speak to, to what they're trying to say. But also gangrene, you lose the cross-references if you put gangrene in there. You, know, you say, what cross-references? Look at Joel chapter 1, verse 4. You can find definition in the Bible. It's fascinating when you study words like this. This is an example of that, by the way. The doctrine tonight does not hinge on this word canker, even though it's going to be very descriptive. Uh, it's just showing you one of the many examples in your King's Bible of it being its own dictionary. Okay. We're in Joel. Ezekiel, Daniel. Joel, chapter 1. Joel, chapter 1, verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. I wonder what this canker worm's doing here. Can you imagine? Have you seen palmer worms, canker worms, locusts eat things? Like, like swarms of them, right? They come in, they start biting things. They, they could destroy crop, right? By coming in and just. And they're not taking, they're not burning it down. It's like there's just thousands of them, and they're. They destroy it by all taking little bites, right? The canker worm, caterpillar. Now, because they don't use the word canker in 2 Timothy 2, um, you lose this way to define the word for you, so it's just gangrene. So what's gangrene? That's just as difficult as canker, by the way. You gotta know something about gangrene to know what it is, right? But there's no other reference to gangrene in your scripture to figure that out. What do other versions translate Joel? The NIV, bless its heart, uh, translates Joel 1, 4 with locust every time. So it reads like this, that which the locust hath left, the locust eats. And what the locust hath left, the locust eats. And what the can't locust is like, what in the world? Because they just don't know what these, animal, these, being, these things are. Like, well, palmer worm, what's a palmer worm? Well, the King James Bible at least puts different things there because they're different. 
instead of locust, 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 locust. Like, that's ridiculous. But they removed the canker worm with the locust, is what I'm saying. It's just kind of funny. Joel chapter 2, 25 is a similar thing. It says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I send unto you. Having repetitive things like that, why does he list these four little critters? Well, because it's going to help you define kind of what they are, you know. You know what a caterpillar is, right? Caterpillar has more syllables than canker worm. Like it's more difficult on the flesh Kincaid reading scale. But you know what a caterpillar is. You draw pictures of it in elementary school. A canker worm is similar to that. You know, these, these insects eat the things. Locusts fly around and eat the things. And so in 2 Timothy 2, when he says, it'll eat as doth a canker, you can see the cross-reference to Joel and say, oh, yeah, that's not good. You know, your crops get eaten up by canker worms. Not good. Right? And so here, the words, will eat as doth a canker. And you're going, that doesn't seem good. Lose my crops like the canker worm, and this is like words that are going to like, what? Eat up people's faith? That's what it's going to be. So that's what it is. So again, you see where gangrene, though more transliteral, may not be the best option here. You don't get those cross-references. They knew about it. Another translation note, just because it's fun to use this as an example, is the word doth. It will eat as doth a canker. You say, oh, doth. Isn't that very fanciful, regal language? No, actually, it's just helpful English. Helpful? How's that helpful? Can't we just say, eat as does a canker? That's how any of us would say it, right? Well, you also don't make a distinction between thee and thou and ye and you either. And uh, so you know what thou means. Thou shalt not. Everybody knows what that means. Even though they claim it's so hard to read, everyone knows thou means you. What you may not know, uh, which is something you should know, is that thou is the singular form of you. Because if I say... I love you, you don't know if I'm talking to one person or ten, right? But if I love thee, the thee, the th, the thee, the thou is a singular person. And yet if I say I love you, if they're making that distinction, it's a plural people. In the Bible, in their King James Bible, it makes that, that's how they translate, that's how they do that. To show you that when it's speaking to a singular person, it's thee and thou, and when it's talking to a group of people, it's ye or you. And so that's why it does that. In the same way with verbs. Verbs is the same thing. Um, with verb endings, with the EST and the ETH. People will make fun of the language. Like, he walketh by the river or something, you know. Well, the ETH, the walketh, or he comest, comest thou, you know. They, they speak to the point of view, the singular person, okay. The verbs ending in ST, like dust, is in the second person singular. So it would be dost thou, right? Or do you, as we would say in, in English. The problem with just saying do you and not dost thou is that you lose the knowledge of whether it's talking about a singular or second person or not. You know, well, I don't need to know all the, the English grammar every time. You don't. Which is why sometimes when I'm reading the verse, you'll hear me just kind of say do or does. Because it's the same word. It really is. But it's helpful. Don't change it in your Bible. Because when you're paying attention to, well, is that one person or two persons? Is that the second person or the first person point of view? It'll tell you in the English. That's helpful. John 3, 7, he says, I speak to thee, Nicodemus, one person. Ye, plural nation of Israel, need to be born again. Right? So it helps. And here as well, like I said, it doesn't change where it's going with the verse, but the doth is third person singular. Okay. So their word, their third person, right? First person is I, second person is you, third person is he, she, them, right? English lesson. And so it says, their word will eat as doth, third person, a canker, right? And so that's what it's talking about there. So just helpful, in case you didn't know why the King James put those endings to verbs, that's why, okay? Some of you who like English are rejoicing right now, others are going, I don't care. Let's move on. Verse 17 and 18 here. He says in 2 Timothy 2, 17, the word will eat us death a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. He could have stopped with, their word will eat us death a canker. In fact, many Christians today do such a thing. They warn about problems, warn about errors, warn about doctrines. And that's they do. I mean, why do you need to name names? Why would you ever? I mean, just out of niceness, out of deference out of you're not the judge of everyone's soul. Why not just warn people of doctrines and be done with it? And there is a fleshly 
idea that I'm going to try to call people out to damage them. And that's true. And perhaps, giving the benefit of the doubt, Christians want to be so nice today that they don't want to be misinterpreted as thinking, I want to hurt other people by naming them. Which is why they don't do that. Which is typically the explanation when, people, when you look up why people we should or should not as Christians name names. Uh, it's you know, out of deference and niceness and politeness and not trying to hurt people. Uh, but whenever anyone tries to look into Scripture, whether it's a practice that is a pattern for the Christian, the answer can only be, yes, we should. And that's inevitably what happens. It's, it's ironic. The other day I was reading something about uh, uh, a Christian leader, and it was answering this question, should we name names as Christians? And it was, well, I've changed my mind on this over the years, and I, I really don't know if it's the best thing, and we should really think about it twice, and so on and so forth. But then as they got to the verses, the end of the, the explanation was, according to the Bible, there's a time for us to do it. Amen. It's like, well, how did that happen? They started out with, like, we shouldn't, and then they ended because of the Bible said that, you know, apparently there's a pattern there. That's because the Bible gives a pattern. Jesus did it. The prophets did it. Paul did it. In the Scripture, people name names. And there really isn't a, 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 it should not be a controversial situation. And I only want to spend time on it here because it is in evangelical modern Christianity. And it's because of the same problem that we saw in the last two or three verses. Remember back up in verse 14, the other translations changed the meaning of that verse to instead of striving uh, about words to no profit, to striving about words. Remember that? Don't fight about words. Remember? And so the, the teaching from those verses then is if you're arguing about words, if you're paying attention to details, you're causing problems. Just don't do that. Rather, the text is actually saying it's words that you should discern, profitable ones and unprofitable ones. So you need to discern words and avoid unprofitable ones. And that comes out again here with the names. When he names Hymenaeus and Philetus, he is making a discernment. Yeah. Those guys and what they're saying is wrong. So he's able to discern profitable and unprofitable words. It's not an ephemeral, uh, here are bad words, make sure you watch out. Everyone agrees they shouldn't fall into a pothole, right? But then when I tell you there's one over there on 3rd Street, you go, oh, all right then. I remember, right? There's one over there right in front of the McDonald's. Oh, you shouldn't hurt McDonald's like that. No, I'm just telling you, there's a pothole in front of McDonald's. It'll hurt your car if you drive through the thing. Right? I mean, there's lots of situations in life where we're very specific and name things that is not because we're trying to damage and hurt people and entities, but because we're trying to protect others from pitfalls. Amen. Right? And this is why Paul's going to name names, but did he just call these men cankers? The answer is yes. I told you earlier that the word canker is still in our vocabulary. I mean, you all know the, word, the, the phrase canker sore. It's, that is the same word here, right? Uh, etymologically similar to the word cancer, but different words. And it, it remains in our vocabulary today through the, the canker sore idea. But uh, he's called these men, and, and, and what they were saying, a canker on the church. A corruption that destroys by eating away bit by bit. That's harsh, folks. It's not like... Those guys need to do some more learning. They're cankers in what they're saying. He also called them, by virtue of the previous verse, profane and vain babblers. We've got some name calling going on here. And uh, I say name call, but he's not simply calling names for the sake of being mean. That's not why he's doing it. That's what I'm talking about here. But it's not the first time he's done it either. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he named two people back there too, Remember? This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. They've turned away from me. He could have stopped right there. And instead he said, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Why would he say this? Is he vengeful? Like, those guys I really hate, you know. He's not just ranting here. He gives the names to warn Timothy of the people. In fact, he says, um, he says later about Nesiphorus, uh, that, he, that, that Timothy knows what he did in verse 18. Thou knowest very well. Oh, Nesiphorus in his house did for me. So Timothy knows Phygelus and Hermogenes. It, he knows them. They're, they're interacting. And so Paul's saying, the people who resisted me, these guys, they're, they, they're leading that charge. Right? So he's aware of these things. Look at chapter 4, verse 10. In 2 Timothy, there's a lot of names he mentions. And if you understand what we'll talk about here in a bit, the reason why he names names, you'll see why he does it so much in this last epistle. Paul's about to die. He does not want to be unclear. Yeah. Right. It's not, Timothy, don't do wrong things. 
1 Timothy 1, 3, remember, teach no other doctrine? There are some vain jangling teachers. He names a couple there too, but look at Timothy all the time. He's like, that guy and that guy, that guy and that guy, and this guy. Why is he doing that? Because he's going to be gone and Timothy's going to remain. And Timothy needs to know where and what is the problem. Look at Timothy 4, verse 10. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You think Demas ever read that? I mean, it's in your Bible. It's inspired scripture. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to say, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. That, you know how much that has hurt Demas' reputation the last 2,000 years? It doesn't look good for him. A question you might ask, well, is Demas saved? If Demas was a workman and a fellow worker of Paul. Yeah. There's every indication that he's saved. He's not saying here he's not saved. He's simply saying at the end of his ministry here, Demas hath forsaken me. The theme of 2 Timothy is faithfulness. Demas apparently didn't have that at the end of his ministry. Now, how is that helpful to me and you? Like, how, what is all this bringing up bad blood or something helpful for me and you? To, why is it in the scripture here that, to know that Demas hath forsaken me? Maybe to understand that even faithful workmen at one point can become unfaithful later. Maybe it's because there's still people that can love the world to understand that temptation. Maybe it's to understand that you, you need to make a discernment between people who, though they're saved and though even may have done work with you before, can still love the world and thus be useless to you in ministry. <clears throat> right? It's not a foregone conclusion, but that's what's happened to Demas here. He has forsaken me. I can love this present world. He has departed. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. <laughs> the Lord reward him according to his works. Whoa! <laughs> There's some questions about that we'll deal with in a couple chapters, but what is that? Like, isn't that a condemnation on him? Well, Paul, he's just being grumpy. This is inspired scripture, folks. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Why is he saying this to Timothy? Apparently, Alexander is going to be someone he needs to know did something wrong here. Did something wrong, not just to Paul personally, but we'll see here in a minute the reason why he's naming them. Because they're doing something wrong to the doctrine, to the yeah. truth. And that's much more important than Paul being offended at something. Okay? Verse 15 says, Of whom be thou ware? See, he tells you why he mentioned his name. Of whom, Alexander, be thou ware? Beware. Look up the word beware in your dictionary. It talks about to be wary of. Right? To be cautious of. To make sure you pay attention to for the sake of it could damage you. Be careful, the stove is hot, it'll burn you. you know, that light socket over there shocked me twice. Right? Well, you're impugning the, the con contractor. No, no, it's just it's what it's done. Be careful of that thing, right? He did me much evil is what he says. For he hath greatly withstood our words. You see that in verse 15? That's why he gives the warning. He did me much evil. What, did he call you names, Paul? He spit on you? Paul could take that. In fact, you know, you know how many persecutions Paul went through? Like, that wasn't the issue. Out of all the stripes and beatings and, and false accusations and, and thrown in prison and everything, he doesn't mention any of that as far as like, hey, be careful, those Philippians, they'll throw you in jail without a cause, you know. He never even says that. Like, that's the world, right? But Alexander, a guy apparently who interfered with Paul, withstood, in, withstood his words. It's the words Paul cares about. It's the communication of the message of the doctrine. It's saying, here's a road bump for you, right? Verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it be not laid to their charge. So again, he's mentioning people here who forsook him, okay? We say, Justin, you're not Paul. I am not, and neither are you. People have that reason. They say, well, Paul named names, but we're not Paul. Why did he name names? It's not something that's simply that he's an esteemed figure, so he's allowed to accuse people or something. It's what Paul values and why he's telling Timothy is what he's doing. Notice he is not speaking about these men, uh, Hermogenes, Phi, uh, Philetus, Phygelus, these guys, Alexander. He's not talking about their personalities. Like, they're just jerks. He's not saying something like that. He's not talking about their preferences. Like, the way they live their life, I just don't, just, I just don't like it. He's not talking about the way they look. It's not talking about their style. The way they teach, the way they speak, it's just, I don't like the way they talk. You know, it's not their style. It's not their mama he's making fun of. They come from a bad family, you know what I'm saying? It's just not good. This is all personal attacks. But Paul doesn't do that. That's not why he's naming them. Okay? He says in 2 Timothy 2 why he names them. In verse 17, or verse 18 rather. He says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. It's, just not, it's not personality here. It's not style, right? Well, some of those preachers, you know, they, they like to hoop and holler and jump around. This is not what he's saying. 
And that, Christians talk like this, you know. It's like, well, that church over there, they do that. It's not a style of worship. It has to do with concerning the truth. Right? If someone errs concerning the truth, they're speaking words to no profit. He calls it profane and vain. He calls it increasing ungodliness. Their words eat as death a canker because their words are not true. That is why. It's not how they said it. It's what they said. So, concerning the truth, they've erred. That's why he points them out. They were wrong. And saying that has come into disfavor lately, apparently, to say that someone else is wrong, especially if they're a fellow believer. Right? Oh, the world's always wrong. Unbelievers, they're wrong. Obviously, they're wrong. They don't love Jesus or something. But Christians, all Christians, every believer, you should never impugn or say anything that could think that, that looks like a Christian has done anything wrong. The world has to do that for us, right? That's what happens. The world calls us hypocrites. And they say, well, that guy did something wrong. And we go, you know, turn the other cheek. Why is it everyone who says they're a Christian gets a pass, and everyone who's not a Christian gets blamed as being worldly? Right? And this is the issue, right? But if that's not the case, and Christians want to blame the world for being worldly, then why can't we look at ourselves and say, look, we've got some problems. See? And not just look at ourselves generally, but maybe say, he's the source of that problem. Why can't we do that? Like, there are errors, doctrinal errors, in Christianity. Yeah. Why can't we say, that guy started it? Oh, there's lots of people following. They like him. They esteem him. If he started a doctrinal problem, it's a problem. Amen. People should be warned about it, right? So, it's not true that nobody's wrong. Everybody's right. As long as you love God and have a Bible, nobody can be wrong. That is incorrect. You can get things terribly wrong. And if you are standing up and teaching others the same error and influencing others to follow you in your error, then there needs to be a rebuke, correction, and if not, you're named and marked in order to avoid the error. The teaching, that's the reason. It's not the personality or anything like that. At this point, people quiver in their boots. Last week we were talking about shunning, this week we were talking about naming names. You know, it's like... This is intimidating. Like, I, I come to church, I want to be part of the ministry, and at the same time, it's like, I don't want to be named and shunned. Well, last week we dealt with shunning, remember? It had to do with teaching, right? Wrong, right and wrong doctrine. Same thing here about naming names. It's one thing to be ignorant of truth. Like, I don't know the answer, I don't know yet, I, I, I have thoughts that are probably wrong. It's one thing to misunderstand the truth. It's like, well, I thought it meant that. Well, no, you're wrong, brother, you know. It's, 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 it's different. Having questions, Mr. Shunning is ignorant. And another thing, to propagate an error. You understand the difference? Like, I've been wrong, you've been wrong, we come together and have questions because we're all wrong trying to learn, right? But when you stand up and say, okay, I got a teaching here, and it's clearly wrong, and you say, I don't care what you say about it, I'm still going to teach it, and in fact, a lot of people love it. I'm going to say, that's a problem, right? So, you should have comfort in the fact that in a godly, Bible-believing assembly of believers, that if you say something wrong, there will be a kind and loving rebuke and correction so that you won't have to be wrong anymore. Right? I'm not going to drag you out in the street, put your name on the billboards, warn the whole world about you. Right? But if you put your name on the billboards, and you are out there publicizing to the world, and you are claiming that what you're teaching is right when it is wrong, then there's probably going to be a lesson or two about, hey, that guy is wrong. And before that happened, guess what? You should probably leave the assembly here, buddy, because you're wrong. Maybe I'll talk to you first and be like, hey, that's incorrect. And you'll say, no, it's not. And I'll say, well, we're going to have to disagree. We're not going to agree to disagree. We're going to disagree. I and mean, that's the end of it. Right? Unless one of us changes our mind, and I'm not going to. So well, that's stubborn. We'll deal with the truth here in a moment. Truth matters more than having one more person in your assembly. Okay? Why name them, though? Couldn't you just warn them of the error? He's talking about profane and vain babblings. Couldn't he just skip the names and go on to verse 18 where he says that concerning the truth they have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already? I mean, knowing the wrong doctrine of verse 18 would then, you know, get people's attention, wouldn't it? Why does he name them? I've got some reasons here, and we'll deal with it. Number one is that they're, they're engaged in work. He's not naming these people because they're the only people in the world that believe this doctrine. He's naming these people because they're speaking words communicating this doctrine. Yeah. There's a difference. Right? There's a lot of victims of error. Yeah. A lot of victims of wrong doctrine. 
Now they carry some of the burden of blame because hey, you should study for yourself, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, there's also just people teach wrong doctrine and people swallow it. Well, who's greater fault there? The listener, the hearer, or the teacher? Well, the teacher is the problem, right? There's nothing to hear if he doesn't teach something wrong, right? He's the source of the thing. And so, why is Paul naming these guys? They're engaged in something, apparently. They're influential, apparently. They're known. You wouldn't name them if they weren't known, okay? Which should help most of you. You're like, well, nobody knows. Well, that, that's good and fine. You study to show yourself approved unto God, and uh, you do the ministry as you do. And by the way, if you're teaching truth, there's no fear of that. If you're teaching truth, if you're growing and you're, you're submitting yourself to truth, then even if you're corrected and reproved, it's like you, you, you change. There's no fear there, right? If you believe what you believe is true, then stand before God with it. But if you believe what you believe is true with that conviction, then you should not expect that no one else will say anything against you. You understand? That's what makes a workman able to be a workman. Like, I know what I believe, I'm going to say it, and guess what? I not only know what I believe, I know what other people are wrong, and when I say this, those people that are wrong are going to bite at me. you got to expect that, right? Else you cave like a house of cards, because you don't, aren't really confident in what you believe. The world is filled with heresies. How do you save yourself from it? Stick to the word of truth, rightly divided. But these people, these guys here are influential, they're known, they're near. He mentions these guys not because they're over in, in Rome somewhere, like they'll never influence the Ephesian church. These people are around Asia there, apparently, influencing the Ephesian church. So this is, it's very easy to name people like, you know, Pope Francis or something. Like Pope Francis, that guy's wrong. Like, you know, like explain to him the error in the Catholic church. It goes back centuries and justification by faith and works, making works an essential to God's sacrament of grace, and it's not. It's God's grace alone. You talk about all the doctrinal error. Oh, friends is wrong. And everybody here, no one jumped out of their seats in shock and horror when I said that to you. We've got no people here who are worshiping at the feet of Pope Francis. Right? But when I say something closer to home, I'm like, well, C.R. Stam, of whom I have one of his books on the back shelf, was wrong about that teaching there. Right? He was wrong about the preservation of the Bible. He was wrong about the book of Hebrews. Right? And it's dangerous doctrine to believe what he taught about those things. You say, well, come on, he's, he's really, he's a friend to us. How friendly is it to teach something errant that can lead people astray regarding truth? You see? So he could be the nicest guy in the world, but we're not talking about his personality, right? And so when you start naming people near, this is where people get uncomfortable. And we'll have some objections here in a moment. He names them because they're engaged, they're influential, they're known, they're near, and they're teaching error as truth. That's why he names them, okay? So why would you name someone? For the sake of the truth. For the sake of keeping the truth pure and profitable. In 1 Timothy 1.19, he names uh, two guys. And he does so in order to keep the truth pure. He says in verse 3 to teach no other doctrine. And down in verse 19, he says, hold the faith, holding the faith and good conscience. Good conscience. I mean, that's pure, right? It's not double-minded. You're not guessing and doubting, second guessing it. Holding the faith. You're holding on to it. Which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. That's how Christians talk right there. Right? It's like, well, and they're Pauline with it. They say, well, there's, we should hold to the faith, we should be faithful and true, and there's, there's some out there in the church that don't do this. It's not a bad thing, you should say that. Right? But then Paul takes it to another level. When he says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan. You don't find this as a scripture reading when you go into the Methodist church. Please rise, we're reading a scripture of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander who I delivered to Satan. But you don't find that. It's not a nice verse. But he tells you why he does it. By the way, what's delivered him to Satan mean? This isn't Paul like the ferry boat man or something delivering him to the devil to be devoured. This is the world. This is like when we come together in the body of Christ, we're serving God. Delivering to Satan is saying, you don't want to minister God's will, then go in the world and do what you want serving the God of this world. That's what that is. You can be saved and be delivered unto Satan. Well, you can study that in 1 Corinthians 5, but he says, he mentions their name here, that they may learn not to blaspheme. He delivered them to Satan so that they, that they would be benefited. How does it benefit someone delivered them to Satan? Because maybe they'll regret the position they're taking by virtue of the fact that they're being cut off from the assembly and the benefits thereby. 
But usually that doesn't happen very easily with people to whom they have an assembly that will willingly follow them to wherever they will go, even to heresy. Then this can't occur, right? You can name people who teach things that are wrong. The Osteen teaches wrong doctrine. And again, we don't have people, you guys here aren't like devout Joel Osteen followers. I get that. This is not in, in your ballpark. But you say that, and you can name his name as much as you want, and many people have. Rick Warren was the big deal in the 90s. You know, they named their names, and guess what? They still have the biggest ministries in town. <laughs> Living to Satan? Uh, that doesn't really apply to them because they got their own mega churches, and people adore. So, so the function of learning not to blaspheme here had to do with Paul simply saying, you need to get out. As these churches are starting, he says, you aren't allowed to teach here anymore. You're not allowed to do this. You're making shipwreck of people's faith, yeah. verse 19. Which is to say, when people do have that influence on the local assembly, and you see teacher teaching error, that is what a faithful workman does. They stand up and say, you should stop do teaching that or get out. Right? Why? It's not personal. It's because we're assembling as the pillar and ground of the truth, and there's a truth that must be maintained. One of the best uh, utilizations of, uh, of non-speakers in the church, which is you folks, all right, is, is listening to me teach, is to hold me accountable. You know what I'm saying? Say, well, if I know what Justin's going to say, I don't need to be there. No, you do. Because if I go off the rails, you need to say, yep, that's wrong. And you're just, you just spoke to the whole room, so you want to make sure that everyone knows that he was wrong. Right? And I'll have two reactions, one or the other. One will be really offended and upset that you said I was wrong, because I can never be wrong. And that would be incorrect of me. Or I'd be like, well, show me the verse, and I can stand corrected, because I want to be right just like you want to be right, according to God's word, rightly divided, right? So there's two responses. Unfortunately, again, that doesn't happen when people don't stand up and make it known that there's an error being taught, okay? Or there's a multitude of other people who are silent and saying, don't listen to that person causing our trouble in the assembly. We love you, brother. Love has nothing to do with it. He didn't name names about about Hymenaeus and Philetus because he didn't love them. That's not what he said. Right? It's the, the error that they were teaching. Paul loves the truth. That's why he's naming them. He loves the truth more than people. Amen. He said, well, the truth is God told us to love people. Yes, but not above him. Right? We love people as God loved them according to truth, and God does not compromise himself in order to love us. Neither should we compromise God or his truth, to love others. And that's how you do it. You speak the truth in love. Okay? Well, what if they're not speaking the truth? And you speak the truth in love. So you read it that way, you understand that truth, and you know that Paul is naming Hymenaeus and Philetus not because necessarily he hates them, but because he loves the truth. He loves Timothy and the assembly, and perhaps even, as he said in 1 Timothy, he loves them because he doesn't want them to blaspheme. Like... <laughs> Is it hateful of your, to, do you hate your children by disciplining them? Do you hate your children by telling them the truth and that they're wrong? There are some parenting philosophies out there that say just that. Don't ever tell your children and limit them and tell them what not to do and tell them what not to think. And don't ever do that. That's fundamentalist of you. It's old fashioned. You're going to hurt their emotional growth. And that's terrible. That's not love, folks. Okay. Love speaks truth, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13. Meanwhile, why, do we, why does he name them? For the sake of the truth, keeping it pure and profitable. Well, how pure? Totally pure. That's how pure. Because Paul just got on saying that if you teach words to no profit, it subverts the hearers, especially regarding the doctrines he'll deal with here in a moment. But secondly, why do you name them? It's for the hearer's sake. You're not naming people, again, as vengeance against the person you named. It's for the hearers of those people who are engaged and influ influential in teaching others. Yeah. That's why you name them, because they have lots more hearers. So there's one guy teaching, two guys in this case, and there's a hundred hearers. So is it more loving to name the two for the sake of the hundred, or more loving to say, well, I'm not going to name those two, and I'll let the hundred go to waste? You see what I'm saying? Why is the hundred going to waste? Because they're going to believe the wrong doctrine that those two are teaching. No, you should give them the benefit of the doubt. They'll hear and know that it's wrong. Nobody says so. So you're trusting a hundred people who are listening to be so mature to know that their teacher is wrong, and yet let him still teach. So which is it? Which shows you something. 
Those who hear wrong doctrine and put up with it are either, one, cowardly to say anything, or number two, don't know it's wrong. Right? That's the only two options. So for the hearer's sake, to prevent the subversion of the hearers, he says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 14, the words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. It's the hearers that he, he cares about. And Timothy is speaking and teaching others to teach the hearers. Right? Ephesians 4, 29, Paul talks about the importance of speaking grace into the hearers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good of the use of edifying may minister grace into the hearers. And it, it's just sad that many Christians, they read these verses about speech, think it's only talking about, just like in the Old Testament, they think it's only talking about cuss words. Take not the Lord thy name, the, the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That, that command, remember that commandment? They think, oh, well, that's, that's four-letter cuss words. You know, it's like saying bad, bad words that might be included in the category, but it's not just talking about curse words. It's talking about you saying anything that God didn't say or saying something wrong that God said. You, know, you getting God wrong is what that verse is talking about. That's what the commandment is. Because Israel was given the oracles of God and the law, and if anyone in Israel rep misrepresented what God told them, then they are bearing God's name, they're Israel, God's people, in vain. They're supposed to be communicators of God's word. When they miscommunicate it, they're in vain bearing his name. Right? You're a member of his body. That's closer than Israel was. A member of his body. The head's in heaven. You're the body. You're supposed to be communicating what the head says to communicate. And when you miscommunicate it, what are you doing? You're taking in vain the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The message. And so for the hearer's sake, prevent subversion. Speak grace to the hearers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's talking about sound doctrine. Speak grace to the hearers. That's just not being polite. That is grace doctrine. Right? Getting the doctrine right. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, who will be grieved if you do not communicate the gospel that the Spirit is trying to communicate. Right? So you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, and you're going to be teachers of the law. What do you think that makes the Spirit feel like? It's grief, Right? He wants you to open your mouth boldly to speak the mystery of Christ, to minister God's grace. So why does he name them? For the sake of the hearers, the multitude of hearers that are hearing them. No doubt when Paul, inspired by the Holy Ghost, named these two guys and pointed out the air they were teaching, it hurt their ministry. I would hope so. Right? Why? Why would you, would you wish evil on people? It's not people. It's wrong doctrine. Do you understand? That's what the devil does, you understand? He dresses up like an angel of light, and speaks error as truth. And that's our warfare. Sound words and doctrine. But when you change the verses to say, well, just don't fight about words. You see how this explanation doesn't make any sense now? If it's not about words, then what is it? It's personal. You see, he's naming names because Paul had a personal grudge with these people. And that's not the case. Romans 16, verse 18, he says the same thing when he says to mark and avoid certain ones, certain ones that were teaching, by the way, teaching something contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. He says to do this because by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Yeah. You see, he does it for the hearer's sake. Why are you marking avoiding people in verse 17? Because there are people who are hearing them, and they're the people you're trying to save. So you're not naming the guys. You think by naming them, they're going to be like, oh, well, now that I'm named, I guess I should stop talking. I mean, you, you hope so, but typically it doesn't happen. Hymenaeus, when he read Paul naming him in 2 Timothy, was probably not like, oh, Paul's named me. I guess I'll stop teaching this error. That's not why Paul said it. If that happened, then great glory to God. But that type of personal rebuke, I mean, that doesn't need to happen in an epistle, right, to the whole church. Instead, he's writing it for the sake of the multitude of hearers. Okay. The deception of the simple, by the way, happens by good words and fair speeches that sound very good, yeah. and the simple-minded don't think it's wrong at all. The simple-minded don't know the deception because they don't know the truth. It's also not something that the teachers have to intentionally deceive in order to be deceivers of the simple-minded. Well, they're not trying to deceive people. It has nothing to do with their intent. It has to do with what they're saying. Amen. When they name Christ and claim Christ and are saved by his grace, and say, I'm trying to minister truth to you, and what comes out of their mouth is a lie, that's the deception, right? So in this way, teachers may not even know that they're deceiving the arts of the simple, and Paul points it out. How would you know? Who makes you the judge? We'll see that in a little bit. 
Why does he name them? For the pattern of faithful, for, the, for a pattern of faithful workmen and a warning of the unfaithful. In Romans 16, where you're there. Romans 16, before he says to mark and avoid uh, these, these teachers, these people who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. For 16 verses, he names a bunch of people. Why does he name them? Hmm? He names them, not for you to avoid them. Right? He names them, he's like, salute that guy. And go say hi to him over there. And you know what? Do what Phoebe says to do. And she was sending me, and they've got some fellow workmen over here. He's naming these people because in Rome, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of groups, a bunch of teachers in Rome. And he's naming them so that the readers of the Roman, the book of the Romans will know who Paul is saying, he's, he's faithful, he's helpful, he's good. And that guy, he's of note among the apostles. But there are some who teach contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Avoid them. So he's naming positively these people here so that you would know that's good. People ask me all the time, is there a, a, a grace of bastards or a simile that teaches what you teach where I live? And most of the time it's going to be no, I have to say. In my mind, there are lots of groups that others might say, oh, they're close enough. And I say, no, because they're teaching wrong doctrine. I say, I'm sorry, it's not a place in your area. But, but how, how good it is when the, the cases have happened, and they have happened, few as they are, where there is a group that I know. I say, well, go over there, right? He teaches it, right? John teaches it, Montana teaches it, they teach it, and they go over there, and it's like, yeah, that's, the, the, they hear the marking of a faithful workman, right? A good pattern. Why would you name names? For that reason. Make a faithful pattern. In Philippians 3, he says that, mark those that teach as we do as a pattern. You have this as an end sample. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an end sample. How do you mark them? You mention them, right? You make them noted, right? You name them so that people say, oh, okay, there's the end sample. That, that's how you follow Paul. Well, then what do you do with those who don't? And those that don't and are influencing others not to do so. Well, that guy withstood our words, right? So you're marking a faithful pattern and marking the unfaithful pattern. And you're doing so to help the hearers, right? Naming also creates clarity. It creates a conversation. Sometimes naming people, no doubt, there may have been a conversation among these people. The hearers of the, the Hymenaeus hearers and the Philetus hearers, they're going, wait, wait a minute, Paul, I mean, I've learned a lot of stuff from these guys here. That was a conversation. That's good. Or there wouldn't have been otherwise. Oh yeah, we're gonna avoid the error. Avoid Philetus' error. Whoa, whoa, Philetus is my teacher. Let's talk about that. It creates a conversation. It creates clarity. It creates those who have ears to hear to hear. Right? And it prevents confusion. We do things like this all the time. It's just in the context of right doctrine. For some reason, we want to make things less significant. I mentioned to you potholes earlier, you know. If you've ever eaten some of my wife's dishes, my wife. I don't have to name her. You know who she is. My wife. Right? And sometimes she'll make a dish. And there'll be a sticker on it. Or I'll, I'll tell people, she'll tell people, Pam's dish is spicy. If she's ever made to you a red bean paste spicy fish, the whole one, the warning would be given, Pam's dish has bones in it. Justin, don't speak ill of your wife. She made a delicious plate here. Look at the platter. It's got bones in it. Careful. Like little fish bones, small ones. Like you think you're biting into a nice hunk of fish and something, ah, sharp bone. You gotta know how to eat the thing, right? Spit out the bones, obviously. You don't need to name her. If I don't name the dish and say, there are some dishes here with bones in them. Now, what do you think? Which one? Right? That dish has bones in it, right? Is that your wife? That's my wife's dish. When you see her name on the pot, the crock pot, that's the one, right? It's not, it's not harming her. It's protecting the eaters, right? Jim's pies has gluten in them. They're delicious. They have gluten in them. We have gluten and gluten-free things downstairs when we eat, you know, and it's like, you, you name them. Why do you name them? Because if you don't put the sticker on them, people are just eating anything, and they're not eating nothing because they don't know what's in it. Because they don't, can't discern by smelling it. Why are you naming teachers? People care more about what's in their food than what it is they hear in their preaching at church. But we're talking about eternal salvation and souls here and God's will. It's like, that's wrong teaching, and you name it. Yeah. Oh, don't hurt the person. I'm not trying to hurt the person. I'm trying to protect the hearers. Amen. It's for the sake of the truth, 
right? It prevents confusion. There are objections to naming names. These days it's objective. There were no objections in Paul's days, it seemed like, to doing that, even though it seems like the flesh would have these types of things. But it's just a modern consequence because people want to be... They, the truth is they love people more than the truth now. And that is wrong in itself. Paul talks about loving men more than God. That's a problem, right? The objections. It can be offensive to name people. It can be. That's not the intent. And if the intent is simply for you to disparage someone, slander them, then you should definitely be quiet, right? But when Paul's naming a name in order for the sake of the truth, because concerning the truth they've erred, for the sake of the hearers, to create clarity and prevent confusion, yeah, it could be offensive to the hearers that love them more than truth, right? So I name a teacher and, the, and half their hearers go, you should not do that. Why not? He's a good man. That wasn't why I named him. That's not why Paul named him. Paul didn't name Philetus because he wasn't a good man, because he erred concerning the truth. But what that testifies is the person who says that is loving the man more than what comes out of their mouth. And that is dangerous when it comes to the truth. Okay? That is precisely what, how people get deceived. Should we rather offend the truth? Okay, well, you're offending that person. You're offending me. You're offending the teacher. I'm not trying to offend, but should we rather offend the truth? People are more concerned about people's feelings than they are about God who died on the cross for your sins, who gave you words to communicate, and they say, well, I can change the Bible here. God didn't mean that. I don't need to say that all the time. But that person, I'll say nothing to offend them. Isn't that backwards? Love people, yes. After the truth. I love the truth, and so I love people so they would know the truth. That's what charity is, 1 Corinthians 13. You rejoice in them knowing the truth and rejoice not in their sin or error. Right? That's what charity is, defined in 1 Corinthians 13. And so we shouldn't offend the truth. Should we offend the truth? Is that, is that what you're saying? It can cause disunity. Because we need to be united in the church. Our unity, look at Ephesians 4, our unity is of truth, folks. Like a broken record here. Paul's speaking about rightly dividing the word of truth. Ephesians 4.3. The saying that goes around now that comes from uh, secular philosophy and Eastern religion is that if you had to choose between being kind and being right, you should choose being kind. And it's like that's just, the whole thing is a fallacy. It's like being kind is teaching what's right. It's the same thing. It's not kind to let people continue in their error. Amen. That is unkind. Right? But that's secular philosophy because they don't value the truth above hardly anything. And so they think, well, you just being right is being selfish. It's not about me being right. It's about God's right words of truth, his righteousness. Right. It can cause disunity. Our unity in the church, this is, this is a common mistake, is not around familiar association. And this is something you have to constantly think about because I know lots of you, and I know lots of you for a long, long time. There's familiar association. There's sentimentality. There's friendship even, right? But our unity here is primarily, firstly, about the truth, Amen. not that. If it were about familiar association and that were the first place of our unity here, then there's a lot more people that I would like to be familiar associated with, but they disagree. And I would just say, oh, it doesn't matter if what, what it is you teach or what we believe differently. It doesn't matter what we believe differently. We can all come together. You've heard that language? That's prioritizing familiar association and relationship of people before relationship to the truth and God, right? Our unity is around the truth. Ephesians 4, verse 3, it says, we should endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, the unity of the Spirit. Like, yeah, that's people, right? Well, no, the Spirit dwells in people because of the truth. The Spirit speaks truth, right? Down in verse 13, he says, we all come in the unity of the faith. See the unity of the faith there? If you don't have unity of the faith, you don't have unity, Ephesians 4.15, what happens if there's disunity in the church around faith, around the Spirit's words? In verse 15, it says, speak the truth in love, that we may grow up into him in all things, that we can all together grow up in the knowledge of the truth. That's how you get unity. You can't get unity around the truth. You don't have unity. It's not the other way where it's like, well, if someone doesn't like someone else, that's disunity. No. Or if someone doesn't come out and, and, and are associated with you, that's not unity. That's 
That's not God's ministry definition of unity. 1 Corinthians 10, or 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 rather. It's odd how the verses that people trot out to try to abstain from identifying error in a group are actually the very passages where Paul's talking about doing so. Verses 1 verse 10 he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. That you be perfectly joined together. See, this is a unity verse, right? So Paul's saying he doesn't want any divisions. He wants us all to be perfectly together. But what does he say? People love the perfectly joined together, no divisions part. How do you get the no divisions, and how do you get the perfect, perfect joining? He says, you all speak the same thing. You see that? You can't all speak the same thing if you're all speaking different things. If you're teaching different things, speaking different things, and you don't have the perfect joining and no divisions. The divisions are created by people speaking something different. Which is to say, as we're communicating truth, if someone comes along in the group and speaks something contrary to it, guess who's causing the division? The one who spoke against it. Not the one who stands up and said, hey, that's different. And this guy says, hey, be quiet, you're causing a division. You spoke something different than what the truth has said for 2,000 years. He says, speak the same thing. How do you get on the same page? Speak the truth and love to one another. Approve, correct, admonish. If you can't speak the same thing, you're not on the same page. That's what he says. He goes on to say, be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We can be together in the church and believe different things and think different things about many things in the Bible. I'm going to say, how is that possible again? Because we're not here because of right doctrine. We're here because of love. How is that defined? Because love rejoices in the truth. Otherwise, you're just loving people at the expense of the truth. Right? We should come as, as in unity out of a love for the truth in Christ Jesus. Amen. Right? So if someone doesn't have the same mind, the same judgment, we communicate and teach and grow together so that we can. But the divisions happen when someone says, that's impossible, I'm not going to speak what you speak, I'm not ever going to be the same mind as you, we're never going to have the same judgment on this. That's going to be an issue. Right? Well, how then can we be united in ministry for truth if we have two different ideas of truth? Right? It's going to be a problem. But you know how many different ideas there are about truth in the world? Lots. So, you see, th this is why people find it easier to forego the truth for the sake of much, it's much more comfortable having a bigger crowd, <laughs> right? This it causes disunity if you name people. But you know what it doesn't do? Destroy the truth, right? And what you might do is get other people to come to a knowledge of the truth. You bring up issues that people don't even know existed, and they learn something, and they come to a greater knowledge of the truth, and you get unity that way. It could ruin their ministry. I mean, Hymenaeus and Philetus were alive. They had ministries. They were communicating and teaching. And Paul names them in his epistle. He's the apostle of grace. I mean, he's someone of repute. At least he should have been as the apostle of the of grace. And they could have ruined their ministry, Paul. Actually, they ruined it by their teaching error. Again, we're not here just talking about you misunderstanding, being ignorant, trying to learn and grow, being wrong. We're all wrong. We're talking about these guys standing in air, communicating it as truth, not being corrected from the thing, right? Just like they're propagating error. Their words does, as death of canker. That's what ruined your ministry. What ruined your ministry was when you started teaching, Jesus stopped being God. That's what ruined your ministry. Yeah. Not the fact that I said that you taught it, because you did. Right? What ruined your ministry is when you said, you know what? There is no hell. That's what ruined your ministry. Not the fact I stood up and said, you're teaching universalism, and that's heresy. I didn't ruin your ministry. You did by teaching error. Right? You're ruining their ministry. That's usually said by someone in it, right, who doesn't want to lose it. Well, more minister and more ministry is good if they're ministering truth. It's also a sad thing to have to call out error among people who should know better. Right? I would love a thousand people to be growing together in God's word, rightly divided, in our community. That'd be awesome. And there's lots of reasons why that doesn't happen, but one of them is the fact that even when people get close to the knowledge of the truth of each other, 
there are people who want to teach an error, and you've got to say, that's incorrect, and they simply disagree. And they'll want to agree to disagree, which is to say we shouldn't divide over this thing, to which I would say, we have to. And they say, why, because you're stubborn? And I say, no, because it's wrong. And I'm the one causing division. Because they would rather stay in error and cause confusion in an assembly where two people are teaching opposite things then divide the assembly. And I've, I've encouraged people before saying, look, you can't straddle that fence. If you disagree with what I'm saying is true from God's word, then you should minister what you think is true somewhere else and do that with all conviction before God, right? But don't say that we can minister together saying two different things and not confuse everyone else listening to us, right? And that's why Paul names them. Like, those guys are teaching, they're forsaking the doctrine I told you, Timothy. And no doubt, Hymenus and Philetus are going, well, Paul, we'll see who wins in the end. You're about to die. You're in prison. We got growing ministries. <laughs> well, that may have been the case. According to Paul, according to the Holy Ghost, they were wrong. Um, so, it could ruin their ministry. Well, they ruined it. Else, Paul's lying. The only way you ruin someone else's ministry by naming them, by teaching error, is if you're wrong about them teaching error. In which case, if you find that out, you apologize profusely. After calling them out for their error, I was corrected and I was wrong about that. And that's how you save face there. Right? That doesn't happen hardly ever either, does it? You'll just split up. Well, they teach good things too. That's an objection. Why name them? I mean, they teach some good things too. In fact, I learned a lot of good things from them. Yeah, but the point of naming them is because they teach good things too. And they're teaching this error. That's why it's so dangerous. It's not hard to say, avoid the Buddhist, Hindus, and atheists. And you're all going, yeah, of course. Yeah, got it. They got like a lot of things wrong. <coughs> but I say, avoid that grace teacher over here. You're going, grace teacher? Wait a minute. I mean, he knows lots of right things. Avoid A.E. Enoch. He'll draw a chart just like I would draw a chart. Paul, mystery fellowship, law, grace, separate, all, the whole deal. Great tribulation, draw a chart. You look at it and go, look at that. What a great chart. He denies Jesus is God. Yeah. I'm going to say, avoid that guy. Amen. You're going to go, why? He, got, he does a great chart. You know, people learn right and divide from him. Rightly divide, heresy. Yeah. Is what it is. Like, the reason why it's so dangerous is it tastes so good over here. You put a little bit of poison in the thing, that's what makes it dangerous. So someone learns some truth and they swallow the damning error. That's exactly the point of naming them. If they were entirely wrong, you wouldn't have to name them. It's just like, yeah, this doctrine's wrong, and that's obviously an incorrect thing. But it's because people don't see the problem. People say, well, I've never heard that person say that, which isn't to say they don't teach it, because I have. So I named them so that you know, keep an ear open. If not, be very cautious, or you know what? Maybe just avoid it. But that way you know. Or investigate the thing yourself. They teach good things, too. This is not about politics, folks. It's about purity of doctrine. Amen. Okay? You know what you do in politics in order to have more influence in politics? You know what you do? It's called being diplomatic. You sacrifice your own personal convictions or preferences in order to get a larger group of followers so that you can have more persuasion in the political. That's how you do it. That's how Congress works, in case you didn't know. Like, you think you're electing some stalwart to go to Congress and to stand for their convictions every time? Very few are the congressmen doing that, if at all. What, how Congress works is they go to Congress and they bargain convictions. Convictions. Right? I was voted on this platform, but you know what? I'm not going to vote that bill according to the platform. If you don't vote for that bill, then we're going to compromise. We're going to agree to disagree so we can get more things done. Right? The Christian church has the same issue. If we had more people, we can get more things done, right? Well, it depends on what you're trying to get done. If what you're trying to get done is communicate pure truth, then I beg to differ, right? Well, you're just stubborn. You, your truth's got to be totally pure, totally what you, you will have no compromise. Exactly. That's called faithful workmanship. Well, you're not going to grow very much, Justin. It's not about the growth. It's about the truth. Amen. But if I wanted to play the political Christian game, then you know what? I won't speak about this for the sake of having two ministries that work together now. And I won't speak about that to have three ministries that work together now. 
And I won't talk about those things and the holidays and the Bible version issue, none of that, so that we can have more people coming out, so we can have more work be done. And guess what? You're diminishing truth, and you have less and less maturity and less and less knowledge of the truth. But hey, you got a lot more people, right? They teach good things, too. That's exactly the point. We're not playing politics here. If we were, it'd be a different agenda. It'd be a different method. It's about purity of truth. A common objection to naming names is it's a stain on the church when there's internal argumentation. When one person points out their error and they fight back and there's debate, and it's a stain on the whole church. And the, and the world's looking at the church going, look, they're arguing with each other. You ever heard this idea? It's a stain on the church, right? No, what's a stain on the church is error being accepted. That's the stain of the church. It's not a stain cleaning up a mess, right? Your floor is dirty, you sweep it up. Oh, that's a stain that you're cleaning up that floor. No, I'm cleaning up the floor. If we keep the floor dirty and no one mentions it for the sake of offending the vacuum cleaner, you know, it's like, well, the floor is dirty. Someone needs to clean that, and maybe I will. We pay a janitor way too much. You shouldn't offend his sensibilities and skills. But, uh, it's dirty. But that's what happens. Isn't it? And the church gets watered down and doesn't do things effectively for the sake of not offending one another so the church can maintain an appearance of unity when actually there's lots of problems and the world sees the problems in the church doing nothing about it. It's not a stand on the church to point out error and to clean it up. Right. Deal with the error. Get it out. Separate it. So when someone says, hey, the church has problems, you say, not my church, not this church. Now, obviously, no church is perfect. I get that. But the goal is purity. Right? The goal is doctrinal purity. And I've already told you before tonight about the church is filled with sinners saved by grace and that sort of thing. We're talking about doctrine here. God's word is true. We're wrong quite often. His word is true and perfectly pure. Okay. Don't you remember evangelical Christian, Matthew 7, verse 5? 7, verse 1 says, judge not lest you be judged. People know that one. Talking about taking the mote out of your own eye, the beam out of your own eye, right? Matthew 7, verse 5. How can the church in unity claim to judge the world if they can't even discern in themselves where error is at? Right? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6. He talks to the Corinthians, saying, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? If the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? The smallest matters within your own assembly. That's what he says. Well, to do that, I have to name someone's name. I have to call someone out. I have to accuse them of an error. I have to rebuke or correct or reprove. Well, all Scripture is profitable for that. Right? And that actually encourages growth in the knowledge of the truth. So, lastly, the objection is, Who made you the judge, Justin? I am the judge of no man. Right. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15, Paul writes that he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And people who like to judge love that verse. Because <laughs> it's the opposite of judge not in Matthew 7, right? But notice he says he that is spiritual. Spiritual means you know things of the spirit. You know spiritual truths. You know doctrines, right? So either spiritual judges all things. How can the spiritual man judge all things? Because he knows things. Thus he can discern things. You know spiritual things, right? If you're not spiritual, as you don't know doctrinal truth, then you cannot judge them. You may have opinions, but you can't judge rightly. because You don't know what the truth is. He says, yeah, he himself has judged no man. The point of that is not simply that he's beyond reproach. Like all of us are fallible, right? It's talking here about Jesus Christ being the ultimate judge of everybody. God's word is the truth. The spiritual man who's trying to defend the truth and stand for the truth can't be judged of any man because he's not standing for his own preferences, but what the truth says. That's what he's saying. In 1 Corinthians 4, this very issue is happening where Paul is being accused of something and Paul's judging the Corinthians over it. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 4, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. What's that mean? You're not faithful. You're not being a good steward, right? Faithful to the words, the mysteries, the truths. But with me, Paul says, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you. Well, that's a hip hypocritical thing, Paul. You want to judge them, but you don't want them to judge you? Why does he say this? This is a small thing to be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. He's talking about the standard of judgment. He says, how you judge is not by your opinion. I don't even judge by my own will. I don't, any man's judgment, I don't hold as my standard of judgment. What's the standard of judgment? Christ. The word of God, rightly divided. 
I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. He that judgeth me is the Lord. He says, I will speak and judge what the Lord said, what the word of God says. Why is he naming names? Because he's judging according to the truth, not personalities, not popularity, but truth. And if they want to judge him, judge him according to truth. God's word rightly divided, right? Paul says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. We'll bring both the light, the hidden things of darkness, and we'll make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. He's saying, you operate according to the truth of God, I'll operate according to the truth of God, God will judge us. But he that is spiritual should discern what's true and what's false according to God's word. Yeah. Right? So, who made you the judge? Well, God did, he made you a steward of his mysteries. He said, here's my mysteries, here's my truth, you steward it, you be a pillar and ground of it. Which means what? You need to maintain the thing, like make sure it's pure, not corrupted. When someone tries to corrupt it, what should you do? Oh, don't worry, he's a brother in Christ. Maybe you should say that's wrong, right? For the sake of the truth. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 6, how you approve yourself a minister is by pureness, by the word of God. Pureness, by knowledge. If it's impure, if it's corrupt, if you have to agree to disagree, there's no unity. Okay. Philippians 1 verse 9, Paul prays that their love, that their love would abound. I want your love to increase, he says, to abound. This is Philippians 1 verse 9. How does their love abound? I want your love to abound. In what? In knowledge and, I spelled that wrong, and judgment. How can I have more love? You need to know more of the truth so that you'll have more judgment of what is not true. And when you have more knowledge of the truth and judgment of what's not true, you can love people the way God loves people. If you don't know the truth and you do not judge according to truth, then you are not loving people no matter what feelings you have towards other people. You're simply making people feel good and sweet without showing them God's love which is commended by the Lord Jesus Christ in his grace. Right? So oh, who made us the judge? Well, <laughs> he prays God wants our judgment to increase according to truth. According to truth, folks. Speaking the truth in love. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness. The scripture of God itself, it's not us that's the judge. It's God's word that's the judge. And if you're living according to it, if it's working effectually in you, then you should have that judgment. Right? 2 Timothy 4, 2, he'll tell Timothy to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Well, who made him the judge? Well, Paul's kind of handed a baton off here, but it's Christ that told these people to preach the truth, preach the word. Right? Which means he's naming people because they're not preaching it right. That's why he's naming them. Isn't that helpful? We'll cover next week what that is that they're teaching wrong. He doesn't just name them and say, well, those guys are to be avoided. He actually points out why that is, and we'll cover this next week. He says, they say the resurrection is past already.